Good afternoon, class. We are going to continue with chapter three. This is part three online lecture. So we're going to pick up where we left off. So we were talking about cellular extensions. In particular, we were talking about cilia and flagella. Um, so I just want to refresh your memory that the microtubules that are contained in cilia and flagella are made by the centrioles, okay? And cilia and flagella are aid, they both aid in movement. Um, if you look at a cell that has cilia, it's gonna be surrounding the entire cell. Um, but cells that have flagella, that's just at the tail, that's like a, a whip-like tail. Um, and only certain cells have flagella, um, like sperm is a, a very common cell that we always use for flagella. Uh, and then microvilli are are uh, also surface projections, but they're um, finer projections. They're finer projections than cilia, okay? And you find um, a lot of microvilli when you want to increase the um, surface area of the cell. All right, so for cells that aid in digesting food, things of that nature, um, a lot of times they contain microvilli. A lot of cells that have cilia, um, they use it as a modal extension to um, sweep particles in one direction, um, like your lungs, for instance. Um, a lot of people who are heavy smokers, they damage the cilia in their um, lungs. The, the cells in the lungs that have cilia, they damage it from smoking for you know years and years. And what happens is, um, you need that cilia to move the mucus out of your lungs, so you always, you know, you 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 um, get mucus um, build up in your lungs, and normally the cilia just sweeps it out of your lungs, okay? Uh, but without the cilia working, because they can get damaged from the smoking, um, what happens is people um, can't remove that the mucus, okay? And then they have trouble breathing because of that. All right. And then we also talk about flagella. Again, they are the longer extensions that propel the entire cell, all right, like the tail of the sperm. And both um, cilia and flagella are made up of microtubules synthesized all right, by centrioles. Okay. All right, and cilia and flagella have this nine plus two pattern of microtubules. The next, on the next slide, you'll see a good image of that nine plus two pattern, um, which is due to nine sets of double tubes surrounding uh, a central pair of, of doublets. And you'll see that pattern just really easy to see, visualize on the next slide. Um, and then cilia movements alternate between power stroke and recovery stroke. All right, and this alteration produces a current at cell surface that moves substance forward. All right, so now you can see very good through this cross section, the nine plus two arrangement, all right, of the microtubes, all right? You see that nine plus two arrangement, all right? And this nine plus two pattern, um, the microtubule doublets and circle two central microtubes. The microtubes are held together by cross-linking proteins and radio spokes, okay? So this is showing you um, the power stroke and the recovery stroke, okay? So you see how it's all moving in the same direction, okay? Power stroke. And then the recovery stroke is when the cilium is returning to its initial position, okay? So now it's recovering and returning to its initial position. And this is showing you um, it moving mucus, okay? So the traveling wave created by the activity of, of many cilia acting together propel mucus across the cell surface. All right, so this is preparing, moving the mucus like I talked about, for instance, that you can have in your lungs, okay? So,
so microvilli are smaller than cilia okay that's why the name micro microvilli so they're smaller than cilia okay um, and they're finger-like extensions on of plasma membrane that project from surface of select cells um, example your digestive intestinal cells kidney tubule cells high right, cells that need greater surface area to absorb um, substances um, so this used to increase surface area for absorption have a core of actin microfilaments that is used for stiffening our uh, projections okay so you see your core of actin filaments right there alright so the nucleus the nucleus is the largest organelle in the cell um, so you can think of the nucleus as the control center of the cell it has the genetic library or blueprints alright for the synthesis of all the um, cellular proteins so of course the genetic information um, things it has the it contains information for your hereditary things that make your eye color hair color um, so on and so on how tall you're going to be and so on and so on all right but the um, DNA in the nucleus also has the blueprints so it also has the blueprints for everything for all the proteins that you're going to need the cells are going to need to make and again um, you might ask why is that important well it's important because remember enzymes are proteins and your cell needs a lot of enzymes to carry out the chemical reactions so it can function properly okay um, so and then also understand too the DNA never leaves the nucleus DNA is very very important so like anything that you have that's very very important right you keep it locked up um, and put away um, and you don't move it around a lot okay so the DNA never leaves the nucleus because it's very very important and you don't want the DNA to get damaged okay alright and just most cells only have one nucleus okay but certain cells um, are multi-nucleated um, which has many nuclei um, um, for instance skeletal muscles um, cells um, and then you have cells that don't contain a nucleus so these are more rare okay but your red blood cells are essentially just sacs of he hemoglobin okay so a mature red blood cell is going to expel its nucleus once it's maturing all right and the reason why it, it expels its nucleus because the nucleus takes up a lot of space and red blood cells remember they function to transport oxygen okay so they are going to expel the nucleus so that they can fit more he hemoglobin inside the cell so red blood cells have no nucleus so when you need to do a paternity test right um, or you need to do a test and you want to um, you know test somebody's DNA right it's not going to be the red blood cells all right obviously because mature red blood cells don't have a nucleus so what you're really looking for are the white blood cells all right that's in the blood all right so here's showing you um the structure of the nucleus all right so again you have the nuclear envelope okay you see right here this is a nuclear envelope and you also see that the nuclear envelope is continuous with the endoplasmic reticulum okay so you see this nuclear envelope is continuous with the endoplasmic um, reticulum okay um, you see right here this big dark circle inside the nucleus okay that is the nucleolus okay so remember the nucleolus makes ribosomal RNA it makes the rRNA the rRNA is used to make um, to make up the ribosomes, okay, where protein synthesis occurs. So the nucle nucleolus again makes ribosomal RNA, okay. And then you have chromatin. Chromatin is just DNA wrapped around proteins, wrapped around histones, okay. So chromatin, um, that's all it is. When you see the word chromatin, all that means is DNA wrapped around proteins, okay. And then you have nuclear pores for things to get in and out okay all right 
So the nuclear envelope is a double mem uh, membrane barrier that encloses the um, jelly-like fluid, the nucleoplasm. All right, so the outer layer, the outer layer of the nuclear envelope is continuous with the rough ER. And like the rough ER is studded with ribosomes, okay? And the inner layer called a nuclear lamina is a network mesh of proteins that maintain um, nuclear shape and acts as a scaffolding for DNA. And then you have the nuclear pores which allow substances to pass into and out of, nu up, out of the nucleus. Um, they are gar guarded by the nuclear pore complex which regulates transport of specific large molecules. All right, so again, chromatin consists of 30% thread-like strands of DNA, 60% histone proteins, and 10% RNA, okay? So again, you have DNA wrapped around these histone proteins, all right, and you also have some RNA. Now, the, now, the reason why you remember, if, if DNA was just um, left to be, left to sit in the cell, the DNA will take up the entire cell, all right? So you need to wrap this DNA around these histone proteins to condense it and to conserve space. And also is a way to organize the DNA too, all right? Because um, what happens is when you need to um, copy or you need to replicate a certain part of the DNA, it can unwind itself, okay? It can unwind itself and then it can um, copy, either replicate that section or you can make an mRNA copy if you're doing protein synthesis of that section all right and then once that has occurred it can wind back up and it's going to essentially keep it organized and also conserve space um, that way all right so the this arrange is fundamental units called nucleosomes okay again nucleosomes which consists of dna wrapped around histones all right um and chromosomes are just condensed chromatin okay and the condensed they help protect the fragile chromatin um, threads during cell division. And when you hear that um, word gene expression, okay, um, so gene expression, all that means is that you are synthesizing a protein, okay? So you're expressing that gene, and by expressing that gene, you are going to synthesize that protein that that gene encodes for. Okay, so when you hear that word gene expression, that means you're going through transcription and translation, which we're going to talk about in a second. Um, transcription is when you copy the DNA into messenger RNA. All right, remember DNA never leaves the cell. No, I'm sorry, never leaves the nucleus. So the, the messenger RNA is going to leave the nucleus and it's going to go to a, a ribosome where translation is going to occur. Essentially, you're going to synthesize the um, protein chain according to the um, order on the messenger RNA. And again, we'll talk about more, talk about that more when we talk about transcription and translation. So this is showing you an image of a um, chromosome, okay, which again is condensed chromatin, okay. And this is actually showing you a uh, sister chromatid, which we'll talk about that in a second. But essentially, a sister chromatid um, happens, you, they get generated during mitosis. And what happens is after DNA um, replication, which happens in the S phase of the cell cycle, um, which, during, which is during interphase, so DNA replication doesn't occur during mitosis. DNA replication occurs during interphase, okay, during the S phase of interphase. But what happens is you have um, the, the new chromosome that gets made is actually still attached at the central mirror, okay? So since it's still attached to the original chromosome, we call it sister chromatids, okay? So we call it sister chromatids since it's still attached. And the nomenclature is kind of weird. You only count a sister chromatid as one chromosome, okay? Um, again, you're not going to be testing all over that nomenclature, but just understand um, nomenclature is kind of funny even though you know that this is a replicated um, chromosome that's still attached at the centromere so technically it's going to end up being two separate chromosomes um, but long as it is attached at the centromere 
it's called a, a sister chromatid and as long as it is a sister chromatid it's actually only still one chromosome so I know the nomenclature is kind of confusing um, but just understand that sister chromatid is a replicator chromosome um, that's attached at the centromere okay Uh, here's just more images of the nucleus, okay? All right, so the cell cycle. All right, so with the cell cycle, okay, um, you have two major um, periods of the cell cycle. Interphase, and the interphase, the cell is in this period probably uh, 85 to 90% of the time. So 85 to 95 percent of the time, the cell cycle is going to be in interphase. So during interphase, you're going to have cell growth, and it carries out on its usual activities. All right. Um, now that 15 to 10 percent of the time um, that the cell is not in interphase, it's going to be in um, mitosis, which is a cell division um, cycle. Okay, um, where the cell is going to divide into two. Okay, so we're going to talk about those two. Um, periods now all right so we're interphase all right so again this is the phase where the cell carries out the routine activities and it prepares for cell division and again um, 85 to 95 I'm sorry 85 to 90 percent of the time the cell is going to be in the interphase one all right um, an interphase has sub phases okay which we're going to talk about in a second, so you have growth, or, or sometimes it's called gap one, um, G one, and then you have um, synthesis. So you have G one, which is growth. Um, sometimes it's called referred to as gap one. Um, you have S phase, but you can think of the S phase for DNA synthesis. Okay, and then you have G two, uh, with the final growth um, before in preparation before mitosis. Okay, do so you see? Um, the interphase part of the cell cycle is the majority of the cell cycle, okay? Um, and then, once you um, gone through G2, you gone through this final checkpoint, you go through mitosis, which is um, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. So, um, a good way to remember the um, phases of mitosis, just think of PMAT, PMAT, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, okay, PMAT. Um, and then cytokinesis is happens after mitosis, essentially cytokinesis. Um, at the end of telophase, the cytoplasm isn't totally pinched off from the new cells that are developing. And what cytokinesis does is, is it's going to um, divide completely um, and pinch off the cytoplasm between the two cells. So you have two separate cells. Okay, so cyto cytokinesis. Um, it's going to um, finalize that division of the cytoplasm between the two cells. Chromatin is uncondensed. Okay, so pretty much what that means is that you can't see the um, chrom chromosomes during interphase. Okay, all right, but during prophase the um, chromosomes are going to condense. That's one of the first steps of prophase. Chromosomes condense and the nuclear membrane is going to um, disappear. It's going to break down. Um, so when the chromosomes condense, so uh, one of the ways that you can um, tell uh, whether the cell is in interphase or whether it's um, in mitosis is look for the chromosomes being condensed. Okay, so chromosomes are going to condense during prophase. All right, so then they become visible when they condense. Okay, so that's one of the ways that you can tell the difference between interphase and um, mitosis. Essentially, look at these checkpoints. If everything's good, um, then the cell says, okay, everything's good. You go on to the next um, phase, okay, of the, of the cell cycle. But if everything's not good, then you need to hold on a minute. We don't need to move on to the next um, phase of the cell cycle. And again, these checkpoints are very, very important 
um, because what happens is a lot of cancer cells they have mutations they have mutations at these checkpoints okay so the mutation at these uh, at, at these checkpoints allow the cell to just keep going past the checkpoints and essentially keeps growing um, and really all cancer is is uncontrolled cell growth that's how you end up with tumors okay it's because the cell doesn't stop at these checkpoints you have mutations that a lot of times you have mutations at these checkpoints and the cell just keeps growing and growing and growing all right and you end up with a tumor all right um, which is cancer which is uncontrolled cell growth all right and a lot of times what happens is you have mutations at these checkpoints Confuse interphase with mitosis. Okay, there are um, subphases of interphase, and there are subphases of, of subphases of mitosis. Okay, so the subphases of interphase are G1, S, and G2, and then the subphases of mitosis are PMAT, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Okay, so please don't confuse. Um, interphase, what's going on in interphase with, with mitosis, um, DNA replication occurs during the S phase of interphase. So the S subphase of, of, of interphase um, is where you have DNA replication. So again, you have to replicate your DNA before you divide the cell. Just think of it that way. You have to replicate the DNA before you divide the cell. And cell division is mitosis, okay? So Prior to cell division, the cell makes a copy of the DNA. All right, so DNA is a double-stranded um, DNA helix. What you can think of it, um, if, you, if you look at a, at a ladder, okay, but the ladder has to be twisted on itself. A twisted ladder is what a double helix looks like, okay. Um, and you have a replication for it, uh, where it's where there's, the strands are separated, okay. And you have this replication bubble, which is the active area of replication. All right, and then um, each strand is going to act as a template for a new complementary strand, okay? So um, you're going to have a leading strand and a, and a lagging strand, and I'll show you in a picture. It's easy to visualize when you see an animation of that. And just be aware that um, the DNA replication, it needs a primer. Um, like if you ever had one of those um, um, lawnmower, push lawnmowers that you have to prime, you have to pump that little prime button okay um because it can't start on its it can't start on its own without priming it um dna replication can't start on its own it can't start synthesizing a new strand of dna um it needs an rna primer okay um so an rna primer is going to lay down a few strands of rna then the dna um replication dna primase um can add to those RNA prime, those those few RNA bases, it can add DNA to those. So the RNA starts to chain off, and then the DNA um, um, DNA primase can elongate the chain. And what's going to happen is, when you get through um, synthesizing your chain, that little part of the RNA is going to be cut out. It's going to be essentially spliced out. Okay, so you don't keep the RNA primer in the final product of the DNA strand, it's going to be cut out, all right, essentially spliced out. Um, but you need an RNA primer to start the elo elongation of the DNA um, chain, okay? All right, so um, DNA polymerase is going to attach. So um, after the RNA primase, um, adds a couple of RNA nucleotides, all right? Um, then you are gonna have DNA polymerase, which is gonna attach um, to this primer, and it's going to elongate the chain, the new DNA chain, okay? So um, DNA polymerase synthesizes both new strands um, one at a time. So you have a leading strand and a lagging strand, okay? And just be aware that the DNA um, Polymerase is directional. It only works in one direction, um, the five prime to three prime direction.
there is a um, plenty of YouTube videos, and I believe there's one um, a video embedded in this PowerPoint that, that I highly advise you to watch, okay? Because um, it's a lot more clear when you see it happening. Um, but again, um, you have this replication fork, okay? Um, and then so you have your two strands of DNA are separated, all right? Um, and DNA, so and again, um, DNA polymerase can't cannot initiate the elongation of I'm sorry, I cannot initiate um, DNA replication. It needs an RNA primer, okay? So you're gonna have to have first an RNA primer be um, put in place, okay? And then DNA polymerase attaches to the RNA primer, which is just a few um, bases of, of RNA, and then it elongates the chain after that, okay? All right, and again, DNA polymerase is um, directional. It can only work in a five prime to three prime direction. Um, when you get up, when I get an image of DNA, um, the replication fork, I'll show you the five prime and three prime direction. Okay, and because of that, you have what's called a leading and a lagging strand. Okay, the leading strand is going to be continuous with the direction of the replication fork. So think of the replication fork if you put your hands kind of together and then you stop pulling them apart. Um, the replication fork is going to be always, in, the leading strand is going to always be in the direction of the replication fork being pulled apart, okay? The lagging strand, the um, DNA replication occurs the opposite direction of the replication fork being pulled apart, okay? And again, when you watch a, um, a, a video of it, a YouTube video of it, it becomes a lot more clear what I'm talking about when I'm saying the leading strand is going in the opposite direction of the replication fork, okay? Um, and just know that you have an um, enzyme, you actually have several enzymes that take part of DNA replication, but the enzyme DNA ligase is going to um, um, splice, it's going to think of it as glue, it's going to glue the lagging strands of DNA together, okay, so it becomes one um, continuous DNA strand, so it's going to um, glue the um, discontinuous lag lagging strands together. So you um end result of DNA replication is two identical daughter cells. Okay, the DNA or molecules are exactly identical to the parent DNA. Okay, so the end re result is of DNA replication is going to be the exact same copy um, of the parent DNA. Essentially, they call it daughter cells. The replicated DNA. Okay. Um, Alright, so this process, okay, uh, is called semi-conservative replication because each new double-stranded DNA is composed of one old strand, which was essentially the template to make the new strand, okay? So again, it's called semi-conservative because you have one old strand and one new strand, and that old strand was actually the template to make the new strand, okay? So remember DNA is double stranded, so you gotta have, you have to have two strands. All right, and it's called semi-conservative replication because of that. You have one old strand and one new strand. All right, so here's an image of of essentially um, a replication for it. Okay, and you see the DNA polymerase. Okay, so again. This replication fork is being separated in this direction. So it's being separated here. It's being pulled apart here. Okay. And you see this leading strand is going in the same direction of where the replication fork is being separated. Okay. You see it's going in the same direction. Okay. Um, and then you see this lagging strand is going in the opposite direction of the replication fork. So what's going to happen is this lagging strand is going gonna, gonna to move on and pull in, fill in the bases uh, where it can, and then it's going to have to stop. Um, and when more space uh, has been created by the replication fork separating, it's going to have to join, and then it's going to have to move again in the direction opposite of, of the replication fork. And again, um, DNA polymerase always synthesizes a new strand in the five prime to three prime direction, okay? Um,
All right. All right. So, um, with so essentially, you all know that cells don't live forever. Um, so, your body cells, um, cells like um, your hair, skin, I, pretty much every cell, they call it somatic system, which are your body cells. All cells except for your gametes, and your gametes are your sperm and egg cells, okay? Um, so all cells except for your gametes, your sperm and egg cells, um, when they need to be replaced, okay? Um, um, and, when they, and they go through mitosis, all right, to generate new cells, all right? Your sperm and egg go through meiosis, all right, meiosis we haven't talked about yet, okay, but just understand your sperm and egg go through meiosis, um, which we'll talk about um, at another time, but with mitosis, you are replacing your somatic, your body cells, like your skin, your hair, and so forth, okay, all your cells in your body except for the sperm and egg, they go through meiosis, okay, so when these cells need to replicate, all right, continuously for growth and repair, all right, um, um, so essentially, the cells that need to be replaced, your, your old skin cells, your hair cells, um, cell, uh, generate the daughter cells, the two daughter cells that are identical to the parent cell. Um, but understand that some cells um, do not divide efficient, efficiently. All right, so... Um, your cardiac cells, your which are your heart um, cells, your nerve cells. Okay, once they get damaged, um, they get replaced with scar tissue. All right, so just be aware of that. Um, but cells that can um, divide efficient efficiently, skin cells, hair cells, and so forth. Okay, they will undergo um, mitosis. Okay, um, and then after mitosis. You have cytokinesis, which I, which is what I said. It's gonna uh, completely divide the cytoplasm. It's gonna allow the cell to completely pinch apart from each other. Okay. And again, control the cell um, cell division is very important. Okay. Um, you don't only want the cells to divide when necessary, uh, but you don't want them dividing when it's not necessary. Okay. The cell is an interphase, either G1, S, or G2. Um, but once it's gone through G2, gone through that last checkpoint, you go through mitosis, which is PMAP, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and then um, the final stage of, uh, of the cell dividing itself is going to be cytokinesis. And again, cytokinesis is um, a separate phase. It's not a part of mitosis. But you need cytokinesis to completely pinch these and separate the cytoplasm apart, so you can um, so you can have two um, separate cells. Okay, so they're not joined to each other. All right. Um, at the end of telophase, the cells aren't completely the cytoplasm isn't completely separated from the two cells. Okay, so you need cytokinesis to, to do that. Okay, so again, you have four stages of mitosis, PMAT. Think PMAT, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Okay, and each phase um, looks different, so we're going to talk about um, what's going on during each phase. During each stage, I should say. I'm sorry. Not... So during prophase, um, what's happening is the, chromato the chromatin condenses, so now you can you can visibly see the chromosomes, okay? And understand that these chromosomes are in their duplicated form, which are called sister chromatids. All right, they're held together in that centromere, okay? So again, it's low confusion as far as the nomenclature, but a sister chromatid is, is still considered only one chromosome. All right, I know that's confusion because you know it essentially um, it's a replicated chromosome, but what happens is the chromosome is still attached at the centromere, so they call it a sister chromatid, okay?
All right, so, and then remember we talked about those centrioles. All right, so, so those centrioles. All right, so the centrosome is going to dupl duplicate um, microtubules that are going to attach, okay, um, to the, essentially to the chromatomes, to the sister chromatids, and it's going to make this mitotic spindle that's going to move the um, chromosomes around during um, mitosis. So they got to get moved around um, in the middle of the, of the uh, cell during a metaphase. They get separated during interphase and so on and so on. So they have to get moved around um, during, during mitosis. And these centrosomes, all right, which again are made up of those centrioles, are going to synthesize these um, mitotic spindles, which are microtubules, all right, that attach to the centromere, and they move the chromosomes, the sister chromatids around, all right, during mitosis, okay? All right, so during late prophase, the nuclear envelope is going to break down. So remember, um, the DNA is in the, the nucleus, right? And you can't move the DNA around the cell if, if it still has a nucleus, okay? So the nuclear envelope is going to break down, okay? So you're no longer going to have a, um, no longer going to have a nuclear envelope, okay? And then again, those microtubules, all right, which are made, which are part of the my mitotic spindle, attach um, on an area of the centromere called the kinetic core, okay, and that's going to pull and move the chromosomes around, okay. All right, so you see these centrioles, like I said, you have your centrioles, which make the mitotic spindles and these mitotic spindles are going to attach um, to the um, sister chromatids um, at their centromere and right now the nuclear envelope hasn't broken down yet on this um, this is the early prophase so the nuclear envelope hasn't broken down yet but as soon as that nuclear envelope breaks down these mitotic spindles are going to attach to the chromatids to the sister chromatids at the centromere, okay? From the central zone, okay? So essentially they radiate from the central zone, but they're not a part, they are not a part of the mitotic spindle, okay? So they're not a part of the mitotic spindle, all right? But they're radiating from this, from the um, central zone, from the centriole. So essentially, what's going to happen is they're going to help to okay. So they're going to push against each other, which is going to cause the poles of the cell to move further apart. All right, so you see during late prophase, you see that the nuclear envelope has completely um, broken down. You see that the mitotic spindles have attached to the sister chromatids at the kinetic core, which is part of the central cent central mirror. Okay, um, so the kinetic core is part of the central mirror, that little um, middle section that's really what's holding the sister chromatids together. Okay, is that central mirror? All right. So they attach to the kinetic core, which is um, a part of the central mirror. And um, now you also see that you have your um, mitotic spindles on the op opposite poles of the cell. Okay, now they've been pushed apart um, by the asters to opposite poles of the cell. Okay. And these are just fragments of the nuclear envelope. Um, these are the non non kinetic core microtubules so remember though non kinetic core microtubules are the asters um, which push which are going to move against push against each other to essentially push the mitotic spindles to opposite poles of the cell okay all right so during metaphase metaphase is real easy to identify the chromosomes i'm sorry the, the sister chromatids 
are lined up in the center of the cell. So metaphase, they can met, metaphase, they can middle, real easy to identify um, cells in metaphase. They are lined up in the middle. The sister chromatids are lined up in the middle of the cell. All right, so think of metaphase, think of middle. All right, so anaphase is the shortest of all phases. Um, so the central mirrors are going to split. Remember, the central mirrors is what's holding the sister chromatids together, okay? So when they split, they now become a separate chromosome, okay? So again, nomenclature confusion, as long as the sister chromatids are attached at the central mirror, they are only considered um, one chromosome, and they call them sister chromatids. Um, but as soon as that central mirror splits, and they separate from each other, all right, now they're separate chromosomes, all right, so the chromosomes are pulled toward their um, respective poles by motor proteins, all right, of the kinetic cores, so anaphase, you see right here, anaphase, you see that the cells are now being pulled, all right, um, to separate poles, okay, anaphase, um, there you go are being pulled to separate poles of the cell. Alright, so telophase is, begins when chromosomes um, movement stops and when now um, each chromosomes, now that the opposite um, ends of the cell are going to uncoil, uncoil so okay, to form chromatin and then the nuclear membrane is going to reform. All right, the nuclear membrane is going to start to reform, okay? Um, the nucleoli, it's going to reappear, all right, and the mitotic spindles are going to disappear, okay? So with, tele, um, with telophase, um, you have your nuclear um, envelopes reforming, okay? Um, the um, nucleolus is going to start to form again, all right? Um, but what? But at the end of telophase, you have almost two daughter cells. But the issue is the cytoplasm is not completely separated at the end of telophase. So to separate the cytoplasm completely between these two, um, what's going to be two new daughter cells, you have to go through cytokinesis. So cytokinesis is going to pinch the two daughter cells apart. Okay. Um, so um, cytokinesis um, is going to begin during late anaphase and, and continues through um, mitosis. And what happens is you have a ring of actin microfilaments that contract to form a cleavage, cleavage furrow, okay, which is essentially going to keep contracting and keep contracting and keep contracting until you pinch the two cells, the two daughter cells apart, okay? All right, so again, you have um, controls and cell division, which are very, very um, important. Um, so you have um, essentially go and stop signals, all right, um, that happen during the cell cycle. And again, um, that are very, very important. So go signals can include things like growth factors and hormones, okay? Um, stop signals um, can, can be things like availability of space, um, normal cells stop dividing when they come in, in contact with other cells, okay? Um, so again, these controls are very, very important because if you get um, mutations in these, in these controls, what happens is you get uncontrolled cell growth, okay, which leads to um, tumors, um, which are cancer. All right, so again, these checkpoints, okay? Those um, go and stop signals are going to work on these checkpoints. Okay, those go and, and stop signals are going to work on those checkpoints. All right, so now, um, so we got through talking about DNA replication, then we talked about um, cell division, which is mitosis. All right, so again, sometimes students, they run um, DNA replication and cell division, which is mitosis, they, they run it together um, with um, gene expression, which is um, 
protein synthesis, which happens in two um, two phases, which is transcription and translation. Okay, um, protein synthesis, transcription, and translation are, are totally separate from DNA replication and then cell division, which is mitosis. These are two separate processes. Um, okay, um, so sometimes students run them all together. Um, don't run them together. Um, DNA replication um, happens during um, S phase or interphase, and then you have cell division, which is mitosis and cytokinesis to completely divide the cell. Okay, um, those are totally separate um, processes from um, protein synthesis. Okay, protein synthesis um, happens through transcription and translation. Okay, um, but like we said before, DNA has the master blueprint um, for um, proteins that need to be synthesized. Okay, so it has the order of the, when we say the blueprint, we mean that it has the order of the amino acids, how they need to be lined up to form the polypeptide chain. Okay, um, the segment of the DNA that codes for the um, protein that codes for the polypeptide, that's what you call a gene. The segment that codes for the, for the, for the protein, that's called a gene, okay? And again, the code is, is determined by the specific order of the nitrogen bases um, that we already talked about, adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine, okay? And they in the red and triplets, um, three bases at a time, um, like their G, GGC, that's a triplet, um, and it codes for um, the amino acid proline. Um, GCC, another triplet, codes for the amino acid arginine. Okay, so each triplet specifically codes for a particular amino acid. Now, there are um, what you call redundancy in this code, okay, in this triplet code. There's redundancy, meaning you can have more than one, more than one triplet can code for arginine, okay? More than one triplet can code for a particular amino acid. So there is redundancy, okay? So again, we talked about that, how important um, the DNA is. So the DNA never leaves something that's important. You want it to stay in one place. DNA never leaves the nucleus, okay? But the DNA has the code, it has the sequence for um, the amino acids that's gonna make the protein, okay, make the polypeptide. So what happens is you have a go-between. You have messenger RNA, all right, which, which is gonna go in the nucleus, okay, and it's going to make a copy of the DNA, but it's gonna make a copy of the DNA that's gonna be in RNA, messenger RNA, okay, but it's gonna be an exact copy of, of the DNA, um, but it's gonna be in messenger RNA that can lead the nucleus and go to a ribosome. Now, RNA does differ from DNA in two main points. Um, RNA is single-stranded. Well, actually, three main points. RNA is single-stranded. Um, RNA does not have um, the nucleotide, um, the, the nucleotide thymine. It has uracil instead. And also, RNA has the sugar ribose instead of deoxyribose, okay? So, um, the RNA that's going to, the messenger RNA that's going to be is that copy of the DNA, except for wherever the DNA had thymine. When, so when you had a DNA a sequence, uh, a triplet that had thymine, you're going to insert uracil. The RNA messenger RNA is going to insert uracil instead. Okay. The other nitrogen bases are the same. Okay. Um, it's just um, RNA doesn't have thymine. All right. And there are three types of RNA: messenger RNA, which, which I've been talking about. The ribosomal RNA, which is going to be make up part of the ribosome, okay? The name tells you what it does. And then transfer RNA, which is going to be, it's going to bring um, uh, amino acids to um, the ribosome, okay? So transfer RNA is going to bring amino acids to the ribosome, all right? And we'll talk about how this process occurs um, in the next couple of slides. All right, so again, your um, messenger RNA is single-stranded, all right? It's going to have the triplets. The triplets are called codons, okay? Codons are the triplets 
That's how the DNA is read. It's read in codons, which are triplets. Okay, but it's gonna have the same use the same bases. Again, this is RNA. All right, but it's gonna have the same order of the bases as the DNA, except where the DNA had a, a, a thymine had a T. You're gonna put the messenger RNA is gonna put a U, a uracil, where it had T's. It's gonna have U's. Okay, but other than that, the um, nucleotide sequence are going to be follow the same, exactly the same um, um, bases as the DNA, and it's read in these triplets called codons. Okay, um, so again, if you see a um, codons and you see these U's, if you see, uh, if you have a question on the test and it has U's in it, you know that you're looking at messenger RNA, okay? Automatically, you know this is messenger RNA when you have, when you see these U's, okay? All right, and this process of, of, of essentially taking a DNA, using DNA as a template and copying a DNA into a messenger RNA it's called transcription, okay? Um, when you transcribe something, you copy something. That's why they call transcription. You're copying the DNA into messenger RNA, okay? And this messenger RNA can leave the nucleus and then go to a ribosome, okay? The ribo ribosomal RNA is going to be a component of the ribosome, okay? So the name tells you what it does. Ribosomal RNA it's part of the ribosome, okay? And the ribosome is where protein synthesis occurs, all right? And then tRNA is going to transfer um, amino acids to the ribosomes, okay? And it's going to work through an anticodon. So the RNA, I'm sorry, the messenger RNA is read in codons. The tRNA is going to attach to the messenger RNA with an anticodon on one end and then it's going to have a um, amino acid on the other and you it's, like I said this is easier to visualize um, with an animation and you see in the next slide um, they should have a, a diagram um, and also I highly advise watching YouTube videos um, animations so you can see that the, all the steps it's easier to visualize when you can see it okay instead of just reading about it okay And I said the same thing about DNA replication, okay? Um, again, being able to visualize it through a, a YouTube animation is going to help you um, put everything together as opposed to just reading about it, okay? Red and codons, which is three... Um, bases at a time, three nitrogen bases at a time, okay? And what happens is, remember how we talked about the, the base pairing rules? Um, um, G is always base pairs with C, and A with the DNA always base pairs with T. However, with um, RNA, A is going to base pair with U, okay, um, with RNA. So you follow the same base pairing rules, except for when you have an A, it's going to base pair with a U, okay? That's the only difference. A is going to base pair with U's. So the messenger RNA has a codon. The tRNA has an anticodon that's going to base pair with the codon all right, using the base pairing rules. All right. But then on the other end of this tRNA is going to be attached um, a amino acid. Okay. So tRNA is going to bring the amino acids to um, the ribosome. It's going to attach to the messenger RNA through its anticodon to the codon. And then what happens is when you have two of these t tRNA side by side with each other, um, the amino acids that are next to each other are going to form a peptide, a peptide bond, okay? And once that peptide bond is formed, one of the tRNA is going to fall off the uh, messenger RNA, and then um, another tRNA is going to bind to the next codon, and then you're going to keep forming these peptide bonds until you form the entire polypeptide chain, okay? And again... Um, you need to watch an animation of this um, so you can visualize it. It's, uh, it's a lot easier to visualize it in your head when you see the animations of it um, as opposed to just um, reading about it and me talking about it, okay? And this process is called 
um, translation, okay? When you make the actual polypeptide chain, it's called translation, okay? So again, protein synthesis occurs in two steps. Transcription is when you take the information from DNA and you, and, and you um, copy it into messenger RNA. Messenger RNA is going to lead the nucleus and go to a ribosome where translation occurs, all right, where you actually assemb assemble the polypeptide chain. And again, um, I highly advise you watch a YouTube video on this transcript and translation so that you can see what's going on, visualize it. Um, it's easier to visualize, easier to understand when you can visualize what's going on. So remember, transcription is going to occur, it's going to happen in the nucleus, okay? Because remember, the DNA gets copied into messenger RNA, but the DNA never leaves the nucleus. So transcription happens in the nucleus. Translation happens in the cytoplasm attached to a ribosome, okay? Um, now, it could be a ribosome that's free, or it could be a ribosome attached to the um, rough ER, the, the endoplasm, the rough endoplasm reticulum, okay? By the way, the um, um, ribosome is outside of the nucleus. It's not in the nucleus. It's in the cytoplasm area. All right, so here's um, a schematic, an animation um, that shows you the steps of um, of uh, transcription. So with transcription, you're using RNA polymerase, and again, don't confuse RNA polymerase with DNA polymerase. All right, the name tells you what they what they do. When we talk about replication, the DNA polymerase is going to make the DNA strand. All right, polymerase is going to make it poly. Polymerase means poly. All right, so DNA polymerase makes the DNA strand during replication of the DNA. During transcription, it's where you're copying DNA into messenger RNA. That is going to use RNA polymerase. Um, RNA polymerase is actually um, needs less help. DNA polymerase, where you talk about DNA replication, it needed a lot of help. Um, the DNA polymerase, it couldn't separate. So remember, DNA is double-stranded, and these double-stranded are going to be um, together until they get separated. All right. Um, with replication, the DNA polymerase, it could not separate the DNA strands. Okay. And also remember, the DNA polymerase, it couldn't start the um, DNA. Um, Elongation. It couldn't start making the DNA nucleotides and then um, elongating it. It needed an, an RNA primer to do that. So you had an RNA primer was first made, and then a DNA polymerase attached to the RNA um, primer, and then it elongated the DNA strand. Um, DNA strand. RNA polymerase is way more useful. RNA polymerase doesn't need all the help that DNA polymerase needed. RNA polymerase can bind to the DNA at what's called a promoter start site okay it's going to bind to the dna at that start site and it's going to separate the dna strands by itself so it doesn't need any, any help separating the strand and the strands all right and that's called initiation um, um so with help of transcription factors rna polymerase binds to the promoter and it separates the two dna strands and it initiates um messenger rna synthesis at the start point of the template strand it's very very important um, that you have to understand that these um, genes have a start point and a finish point, okay? Very, very important. If they didn't have a start point and a finish point, you're going to end up with a protein um, that is incomplete or too long. If it doesn't start and finish at the right at the right spots, and if it's incomplete or too long, it's going to end up being a non-functional protein. So it's very important that it starts and stops at the right um, location, okay? So then you have the elongation phase. Um, the RNA polymerase moves along the template strand, and then it's going to be adding um, um, RNA bases um, one, uh, to the mRNA all right, as it unwinds the DNA double helix. Okay.
Um, so now you have the elongation phase and the um, RNA polymerase essentially adding bases that are complementary to the DNA in the right R messenger RNA spot, okay? So you're synthesizing this messenger RNA that's complementary to the template strand of the of the of the DNA, the template strand of the DNA. Okay, this messenger RNA is complementary to the template template strand of the DNA. Alright? And then you have the termination is when the messenger I'm sorry, when the RNA polymerase reaches the termination signal, which is right here, and then essentially the RNA polymerase is going to just fall off, okay? But here you see um, a blown up figure of the um, RNA polymerase working. So again, here is the template, the temp, uh, template strand of the DNA, and here is your messenger RNA, which are um, the RNA polymerase is adding bases to the messenger RNA that are complementary to this DNA template strand. So remember, the only difference with this messenger RNA, whenever you have an A, um, the messenger RNA is going to insert a U, okay? Um, but the other base pairing, the G and the C, are still the same, okay? Uh, so, the me so the RNA polymerase is inserting bases, um, RNA bases that are complementary to the DNA um, template strand. So again, I advise you, watch the YouTube videos, okay? All right, so translation uh, is a step of protein synthesis where um, the language of the nucleotide, the, the codons, essentially, remember the codons is, is how it's read in three bases at a time, the codon is translated into the language of proteins, okay? Um, which is the, the codon codes for a particular amino acid, all right? So the process involves Again, um, messenger RNA, um, which is, has the genetic code, the tRNA, which brings the amino acid to the ribosomes, okay? Um, and again, the ribosomes can be free in the cytoplasm or it can be attached to the rough ER, okay? It just, just depends on where the ribosome is located. But protein synthesis translation always occurs on a ribosome. Sequence of DNA is, is represented by a complementary three base sequence of messenger RNA, which is called a codon. Okay, um, there are 64 possible codons. Okay, um, but and there are um, also three stop codons. Okay, so there are only 20 possible amino acids. So there's a lot of redundancy. So you have a lot of different um, codons that um, essentially code for the same amino acid. Okay, and that redundancy helps protect protect against um, transcription errors. Okay, a lot of times if you just sh change one base in the codon to another base, a lot of times it still represents the same amino acid. So that redundancy helps protect from error. Okay. Um. So again, tRNA has this anti-codon, which is going to be complementary to the codon. Um, messenger RNA. So this anti-codon is UAA. So what would be the codon for the messenger RNA? What's complementary to you? A. That be this would be A. The codon for messenger RNA, RNA would be A. What's complementary to A? Remember, remember um, RNA does not have T, so it'd be U. Complementary to this A, it's going to be U, and complementary to this U, it's going to be A. Okay. So it's going to be A U. A would be the codon, and this is the anti codon. Okay, so the anti codon is bind to the codon of the messenger RNA. At one end of it, on the other end of the tRNA, you're going to have a, a corresponding amino acid. Okay? And what happens is, um,
Okay, and this is the end. Um, so you have an incoming um, ribosomal subunits. They sandwich the messenger RNA, kind of like a sandwich. Okay, um, they sandwich it, and then you have your um, tRNA brings in the tRNA to the ribosomes, and you start synthesizing your uh, polypeptide chain. All right, so you see as you start from the messenger RNA, the incoming ribosomal subunits, you have what's called a large and a small ribosomal subunit, and they sandwich the messenger RNA, and it slides down, slides down, and as it's sliding down the uh, messenger RNA, the polypeptide chain is growing. You're going to have more and more um, tRNAs coming, binding to their um, co um, codon, using their anti-codon, and then the two, the, the two amino acids that are near each other are going to form a polypeptide chain, and then one of the um, tRNAs is going to fall off, and that's going to open up space. Um, then the ribosome is going to slide down the messenger RNA. It's going to open up space for another tRNA to bind, and then it's going to um, um, have two amino acids near each other. That's going to form a, a, a peptide bond, and this keeps going on and on and on until you have a growing peptide chain until you reach the stop um, signal. All right, what happens at the stop signal is um, the ribosomes fall apart, okay, um, and then you have your completed polypeptide chain, okay. But again, I highly advise you watch the animation. All right, animation, there's a lot of cool, good animations on YouTube that help you visualize this um, a lot easier. All right, so again, this is another um, schematic of, of pretty much what we got through talking about. Um, Which is methionine? Okay, so um, this tRNA carrying methionine um, is going to through its anti-codon is going to bind in the P site. So you start off with the P site um, to the um, codon through the anti-codon. You see um, U to A, A to U, um, C to G, and then at this other end of the tRNA you have your methionine. Okay, so that is um, that is um, the initiation phase. All right. We have a um, tRNA. Um, with uh, in this case, you already have a, a growing peptide chain. You all you have several amino acids in the P site, okay. But now you have an empty A site and you have an empty E site, okay. So what happens is a new tRNA comes to the A site by carrying amino acid, okay. So that's happened at 2A, and what happens at 2B is a peptide bond is formed between um, the tRNA that you brought this amino acid in the A site and the P site and what happens is when you form the peptide bond the um, polypeptide chain that was um, attached to the tRNA in the P site completely transfer it to the tRNA in the A site okay so now um, you have the um, poly grown peptide chain is now been transferred from the P site to the A site when you form a peptide bond with the um, amino acids between the A and the P site. Now what happens is the ribosome is going to slide. Okay, it's going to slide, and what happens is the um, tRNA that was in the A site is now in the P site, and the tRNA that was in the P site is now in the E site. And think of the E site as the exit. Think of E as exit. So the E site. The um, tRNA in the E site is going to be released, okay? So it's going to be unloaded. It's going to be it's the, so that tRNA in the E site gets exit. And what happens is now you just as long as you're going to keep growing, you just go back to now you have an available A site. You have an empty A site 
in the empty E site. So now another amino acid, another tRNA is going to come in to the A site, um, form a peptide bond between the A and the P um, tRNA, and the, uh, the P tRNA is going to shift the polypeptide chain to the A tRNA. Um, so now um, the ribosome is going to slide. So now the ribosome, the, sorry, the tRNA that was in that was in the A site is in the P site, and the tRNA that was in the E site, I'm sorry, that was in the P site, is in the E site, and that um, E site tRNA is going to fall off, and now the A site is empty and the E site is empty, and you have a, a, a growth peptide chain in the P site. And if you're going to keep going, what happens is now another tRNA comes to the A site, forms a peptide bond between the A tRNA um, amino acid and the P tRNA amino acid, and that growth peptide chain is going to be transferred from the P tRNA to the A um, tRNA in the process. And now what happens is um, the ribosome is going to slide, and the tRNA that was in the A site is now going to be in the P site. And the tRNA that was in the P site is now going to be in the E site. And E site tRNA is going to be released. Um, and the A site is now going to be empty. And you keep going this process um, 2A, 2B, 2C. It keeps going through these two, three steps until you reach a termination codon. Um, a termination codon doesn't add code for an amino acid. So what happens is, um, since it doesn't code for amino acid, um, you have release factors that cause the ribosome to separate. And then uh, the polypeptide polypeptide chain becomes free and you have your new uh, polypeptide chain okay so again I highly advise you watch a YouTube video it'd be a lot more clear the YouTube video you can visualize the steps a lot easier so I highly advise watch a YouTube video alright so again um, summarized from DNA to proteins that's called gene expression you heard that word gene expression that's from DNA to proteins. That's what it is. Um, so it involves um, the DNA being um, copied into messenger RNA, all right? and it's, it's copied in triplets, which are called codons in the me messenger RNA. All right? So the, the codons in the messenger, uh, messenger RNA is going to base pair with the anti-codons in tRNA, all right? which brings the correct amino acid to the ribosome, okay? um, which that's going to... Um, when the ribosome is, is, is reading the messenger RNA and, and, and the growing and then growing a polypeptide chain, that's called translation. Okay. Alright, so again, this is showing you the DNA um, basis. So remember DNA, you know you're looking at DNA when you see these T. When you see these thymines, you know you're dealing with DNA. Now when that DNA gets transcribed, when it gets copied into messenger RNA, those um, it's going to be complementary to the DNA. But where you would put a T, so this A that normally would be complementary to a T, you have a U instead. All right. So when you see these U's, you know you're dealing with messenger RNA. Okay. And then the um, tRNA has an anti-codon that's complementary to the codon. Okay. So the anti-codon is complementary to the codon. So A to U, U to A, G to C. You see it's complementary to the codon. But on one end, and then the other end of the tRNA, you have a amino acid attached, okay? And then the stop codon doesn't code for amino acid at all. So this stop codon does not code for amino acid at all. into the um, um, cistern um, and then what's going to happen is an enzyme step three an enzyme clips off the signal um, sequence and as the protein synthesize continues sugar groups may be added to the protein um, and step four in this example the completed protein is released from the ribosome and folds itself into the 3d conformation a process aided by molecular chaperones and now it's going to um, be 
um, transported in a vesicle. Okay, so the protein is closed within this protein coated transport vesicle. All right, and the transport vesicle makes the way to the Golgi apparatus, where it's going to be further processed and packaged and sent to its final destination. Okay, so that's just showing you the um, how a message RNA could be um, attached to a ribosome that's free, um, but then a signal um, recognition particle can direct it to the ER, to the rough ER, where it could be finished um, synthesizing a um, protein and then um, transported in a vesicle to the Golgi apparatus, okay? All right, so that is the end of chapter three. And again, there's a lot of information in chapter three in chapter so that is the end of the slide of um, chapter 3 and again there's a lot of information in chapter 3 hopefully a lot of this stuff um, will be reviewed from, other, for, from another biology class that you have taken before so hopefully a lot of this stuff will be reviewed um, but it, again there's a lot of information in chapter 3 um, it goes through a lot, of, a lot of material but again hopefully a lot of this um, will be reviewed from um, other biology courses you have taken.